Now the first key design test design method is really equivalence class partitioning. What this is is that equivalence class partitioning divides large value sets into partitions that are called equivalence classes. And how are they defined? Well, the program is expected to behave the same for all values in the equivalence class. And then the test is done with the representatives that covers the whole equivalence class of possible values. Consider, for example, a, a function that maps points, for example, t to be taken, you know, points you can get in a test, to a grade that is supposed to be A through F. And then you see below here the mapping. So you see that from 90 to 100 points you get an A, from 75 to 89 you get a B, and so forth. And then, of course, greater 100 is illegal and less than zero as well. Now you see here that this function that we're actually supposed to test, or that is written in code, is already specified as equivalence classes because you say the program is supposed to behave the same for all of these values and give you an A as a return. How would you test this? Well, very simple. You pick one representative for each equivalence class, and then you make sure that each of those target values, the outputs A, B, C, D, F, actually is delivered correctly. So for instance, you can pick some values like these here, 12, 50, and so forth, as some kind of middle representative of these classes. And then you would say, OK, I've done the test with a representative of this equivalence class. Consider in another example. So you say you have a, a field on the screen that you're looking at, and it's called age. How would you test this? Well, very clearly, the proper equivalence classing where defined as the program behaves the same is totally dependent on program semantics. It's a little clearer than in the other example here. So you really need to know about the program, what it's supposed to do. And for instance, in this case, let's say it's an insurance application where age is the field of an applicant, and then there's three different contracts or formulas offered for different age groups that you can see here. So those now are the equivalence classes. And then you have to test, of course, for those. So it doesn't matter what you see, you have to always know what is behind this field, what is behind this value, and what does the program define as equivalence classes where it is supposed to behave the same. Now the same, of course, means that the same, in this case, the same contract is selected, not the, the same output value for some um, costs or whatever policy uh, is offered. But you know what this means, of course. So in this case, again, we would see typical classes like these, and you can see 18 to 30, 31 to 50, and so forth, as the names of equivalence classes, and then you can pick some representative in the test. Sometimes things are a little more tricky, because sometimes equivalence classes are not found in individual parameters, but in sets of related parameters. A well-known example of this is the triangle test program. So consider, for example, a program that reads three integers, A, B, C, and those are interpreted as lengths of the sides of triangles, and the program is supposed to print out whether the triangle is equilateral, isosceles, or scalene. So you see the uh, figures down here, what this actually means. Those terms are not so well known. And of course, there is a case where it's not a triangle. So if the edges here are too short, then you cannot have a triangle. So in this case, you, the output would be not a triangle. To define the equivalence classes for these, it's not a single number, but then you would have to say, for instance, equilateral, it would be, okay, 333, 444, four, four, things like that. Isosceles could be 552 or something like this. So you have two equal and one smaller one than the long ones and so forth. So the definition of the uh, equivalence classes are actually triples of values, and they're the dependency between those actually that defines the sets. So this can also happen, and then you do the equivalence classing on this higher level. Sometimes you do not need equivalence classing at all. It's important to know that you do not try and force this all the time. When there are only few values, or all values are handled significantly differently in the program, you would not do equivalence class partitioning at all. If you, for instance, look at the little example here below, you see one radio group with three items, three values, and then three binary switches with on and off, yes, no, or whatever you want to call this. And so in the end, what do you have here? Well, you have four parameters, one parameter with three values, and three parameters with two values each. So in this case, you would not do any equivalence classing. 
and you would just treat them as it is as it and it does of course applies to UI and the same thing for an API I finally want to introduce here a in a little exercise we will not look at the results you have to do that uh, on your own in the in the PowerPoint but um, think about this example and this is actually quite difficult so it's not a non such a trivial example as the ones we had before you look at this box here this is actually an excerpt from a spec that said what is supposed to happen when you specify and put data for a field user that you would see here so you put kind of strings here and it says you can have allowed characters that are alphanumeric you can have a single user you can have a range so user 1 dash user 2 then you have list of users with comma separated and you have the usual wild cards star and question mark now how would you test this this is something to think about and you will see a sample solution in the PowerPoint one word about the table that you see here below it's a good thing to think in equivalence classes in this terms of this table that you first say you give like a, a name to a case so for instance if we think about single users then we are in the single user case and then we think about valid and invalid cases you think about a logical class name and then you write the representative only after that so think first think about logical class names and then you go through them one by one another important point you see here at the end an important value called empty if a field can be empty it also of course has a semantics that must be tested anyway this is the example for exercise and look at the result or one result in the PowerPoint to uh, get some practice with this technique